Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Baba Batra Daf Kapay. We're going to get started at the top of our Daf, continuing with items that one needs to, or things that one needs to distance from the city as it affects the inhabitants of the city. So you have to distance to bodies of animals, cemeteries, and the tannery from the city. Issue is, Rashi says, all these things have foul odors associated with them. Some people say that the cemetery does not have to do with foul odors, but the cemetery has to do with the fact that people will see the cemetery all the time. They come into the city, it'll depress them, and therefore we should keep the cemetery farther away from the city. And the Borski, not only does it have to be distance 50 cubits, but it can only be on the eastern side of the city because the eastern winds are meant to be calmer winds and not any other wind is going to, and particularly the western winds, are very strong and they're going to blow the smells right into the city. Rabbi Akiva Omer, really you can do any distance, just not from the west. So he says, it's not a problem north-south or east, obviously, but any, right, just not west. And Marchik Hamishimama. Okay, so he says north, south, east is totally fine. And one needs to distance 50 cubits. We have to understand this line to what is it referring. North, south, east is okay to do even not within 50 cubits and west you would have to distance 50 cubits. Or does it mean where you can do it though, you still have to distance 50 cubits. It's just, it's just you could do it. So we'll get to that in the Gemara. This we saw already on Daf Yud Chet. You have to distance the, where you're soaking the flax from vegetate, from vegetables growing and krishim and salim and the leeks from the onions and that's a hardam and advolim and the mustard seeds from the, the mustards growing from the bees. For Rabbi Yossi, Matir B'chardal, he permits with the bees. We'll get to that later. Why he permits, we already saw it on Daf Yud Chet. Ibayalu. Comes the Gemara and asks the question that I mentioned before. Rabbi Akiva Hechi Kamar. How did Rabbi Akiva, how do we read Rabbi Akiva? L'chol ruach say You could do any direction. V'somech. And put it right next to the city, meaning north, south, and east, you could go right next to the city. Other than the west, on the west, you'd have to distance it 50 cubits, and then you could do it. Or perhaps we mean any distance you can do it, but you have to distance yourself 50 cubits. In other words, any distance works, any side works as long as you distance it 50 cubits. Other than the the West, where you can't do it at all. Tashma. So now we're going to learn from a different source. We'll get to an answer to our question. Detanya. Rabbi Akiva Omer. Lechol ruach oseh rakik hamishim ama. Chutz mi ma'arava de'eno oseh kolikar mepnei shi'itadira. So now we have a brighter which says explicitly what the Mishnah wasn't really very clear about. You can do it in any direction. But you have to distance of 50 cubits other than the West where you can't do it at all because it's Tadira. Tadira is common. So what does this mean, Tadira? We assume it means the wind commonly comes from the West and that's the issue. Okay, and, and we described before that the Western wind is the strongest, which may be true, maybe not. We're going to see that perhaps the issue is really something entirely different. My Tadira, Ilay Matadira Baruchot, it's the most common wind which, by the way, doesn't mean it's the strongest. It just means it's going all the time, or the most frequent. Wait, but we have this statement in the name of Rav that says, Four winds blow every day, and the Ruach Tzvonit blows with all of them. Meaning, winds blow from all directions throughout the course of the day. But every time the wind blows, the northern wind blows with it. Now that means, if you figure out, right, that means... The northern wind is the most frequent wind because it's blowing every time some wind blows, the north wind blows with it. Now, why does the north wind blow with all the other winds? We're going to see right now that it's a calming wind and it tempers the other winds. Because <speaking in Hebrew> if it weren't for that, the world wouldn't survive even one hour. <speaking in Hebrew> and again, what we're going to say is the winds are very strong. Here it says it's the south wind that's the worst. And the north wind basically calms all these winds down. Now, how do we know that the south wind is the worst? Okay, you're going to see different statements about the winds, and it seems that there were different opinions about which wind was actually the worst or not. And some of them are going to contradict each other. Some of them will deal with it. It's not so clear, all these things about the winds. We're going to have a bit of an off-the-track kind of duff. We're going to get into all sorts of things about how the sun 
goes around the earth, okay, which we know not to be the case, but the Gemara had their way of, you know, they, they were under the Ptolemic view, you know, Ptolemy and, and his view about how the world worked. Um, and, and how, you know, the earth is the center, the sun goes around the earth, and we're going to discuss how this works and some issues that they were trying to grapple with that they kind of saw and tried to figure out how this is. Bit of a strange type of sugya, not your typical sugya, that we have seen things like this before. Um, but we're not there yet. So now we're getting off all about the wind. So first we want to understand what Rabbi Akiva said when he said the south, um, the west wind is tadira. It can't be common because of the statement. Now we're in the middle of the statement. Ruach Jomid is the hardest, the more, most difficult of all the winds. And again, the north wind tempers that wind and all the other winds. If it weren't for Ben Nets, which was an angel, that would calm down, that apparently appeared as the north wind, and or appeared in the north wind, and it would stop, it stopped the south wind. If it didn't stop the south wind, it would have destroyed the world. Shanamal, how do we know this? From a Pesach in Eov. In Eov, it's a Pesach that says, God is talking to Eov and says, what, you think you did all this? From your intelligence, what, you think it's all because of you, that, that the Nates came and, and spread its wings to Teman. Now, Teman is from Yemin, which is right, but which is understood to be a reference to the south. Okay, the Yama, Temana, Tzafona, Venegba, okay, the, um, the, the Teman is often considered a, a direction of south. Elamai Tadira, so now they say, okay, it can't be that basically, because the, the north wind is going to basically save the south. Um, uh, and there you see the north is the most common wind because it's always out there. That was really where we got to this from. So, Elamai Tadira, Tadira Bishchina. Now we're going to see that the Shechina is in the west. Now, this is an interesting thing. We're going to have a whole discussion. We're going to have, perhaps we could count them as five. This could be a little bit difficult question. You'll see my deliberations about how many opinions really there are about this and how to count them. But let's suggest right now we'll have a maximum of five different approaches to where the divine presence exists in the world. So basically what they're going to say is don't put the tannery on the west because that's where the divine presence is. And that's disgusting to put something smelly and, and with a foul odor in the west where the God's presence is. Okay, how do we know that the Shechina is in the west? Let's be thankful to our forefathers that they told us how to pray. Dichtiv, as it says. Okay, this is a verse from um, Nehemiah, and that must be who we're talking about, Avotenu, to Ezra Nehemiah, perhaps the Anshu Knesset HaGadola, some people explain. It says, The heavens bow to you. Now, if the heavens bow to God, where does that put God? Well, let's think if the, if the stars and the moon and the sun, okay, now, the sun, basically being the main one, rises in the east. So when it rises in the east, and then it keeps rising, it faces toward the west. So that must be that God is in the west, because the sun is basically rising from the east, facing toward west, and therefore, um, and therefore bowing toward God. Matzke flower of Acha Bar Yaakov, Dilma Ke'evet Shenotel Pras Merabo, Vechoseo L'Achorav V'Mishtachad Me'a, wait a minute. That doesn't prove anything. And perhaps he's suggesting an alternative reading, and he's suggesting an alternative reading of this pasuk, which is if they're bowing, you assume the sun is facing toward God. But often, the sun, if the sun is leaving from God, maybe it's a better way to say it, God's in the east, sun rises every morning, and the sun backs over to the west without turning away from God, like the way people leave the Kotel and they try not to turn around. Right, so maybe it's that. Now, whether he thinks that really that means God's presence is in the East, or he's just playing devil's advocate here and saying that Pesach doesn't prove anything. So that's why I'm not sure how to count whether this counts as the second one, or perhaps it's really just a uh, uh, knocking out of the first one. But let's perhaps say maybe there's two, God is in the West, or God is in the East, and you know, the divine presence of God. Okay. Now, right, they give it as an example of an Evid that gets a, a present from his master, and therefore, you know, backs away from his master as a sign of respect, doesn't turn his back to the master. Kasha. So, in fact, this is a good difficulty against Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Now we're going to move to a third approach, okay, either second or third. Um, Rabbi Yeshua sabal shechina v'chomakom. 
the pres divine presence is everywhere. Right? This song I grew up on, maybe some of you also, right? Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is truly everywhere, right? Up, up, down, down, right, left, all around. God is everywhere. Okay, there is no unique place of God. To Amar Rabbi Yoshai, my daftiv atah Hashem levadcha, levadecha atah asifa et hashamayim and shemei hashamayim. Okay, you are God. You are singular. No one is like you. You created the heavens, and it talks about all those kind of things up in the heavens. So now the uses is a reference to God's messengers, and it says, "God, how are you different from anyone else?" Well, shluchech alok shluchei basar vadam. Your messengers are not like messengers that humans send out. Shluchei basar vadam mimakom shemeshtachim l'sham machzir l'sham. Sorry, mimakom shemeshtachim l'sham machzirim shlekutan. One of the definitions of a messenger is that the messenger goes out. Delivers a message, comes back or does an action for the person who sent the messenger, and then comes back and tells the person, "I fulfilled the mission." This came up in a sugi in Gitim, by the way. About there was a whole thing about a woman being able to deliver. I forget exactly the details, but there was this problem that she couldn't go back and report that it, the, the the agency was done. I forget exactly what the context was, but there was definitely a sugi there that talked about this. And that is, and, and there it was like, where do we get this from? And actually, it's no, it's also mentioned in this sugi. That it's part of what what agency is, but so you know you go like let's say I go from New York to California to take care of something for someone, and then I go back to New York and I say I took care of it. Right nowadays you might send the WhatsApp, but you know in those days there wasn't. But it's the place that you go to. From there, you can report to God that you did your message. Because if the right these angels that God sends, or any kind of whatever we call God's messengers, they go do something, and then they stay there because they could just tell God there I did it. Because God is everywhere, and that's the uniqueness of God. So now they say, right, and there you see God's presence is everywhere. That was this proved, and we're going to prove it from a pasuk shenemal. Besides this, Tehal Shem Levadecha, which just said God was. Singular, in what way was he singular? But how do we know that in this way God is singular? Shneema are again a passage from Eov, where again God is saying, What do you do this? Meaning, these are the things I do. Hatishlach brakim vayalech, or you sending messages and they will go. Viyomru lechahineni, and then they'll tell you that we're here. Meaning, they'll tell you they did their message, their agent, what you sent them to do. Yavo viyomru lo neemar, it doesn't say they will come back and tell you, it says vayalechu vayomru, they will go and tell you. Meaning, they didn't have to come back because God's presence is everywhere. And okay, there we learn the divine presence is everywhere. Rabbi Yishmael Savar. Not only Rabbi Yoshaya says this, we're going to see three people who said this. That Savar he held, also Rabbi Yishmael, which by the way makes sense. He, dif- he disagrees with Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva said, on the West, you can't put the tannery. And we explained, right? And Rabbi Akiva says, because it's Tadir. And we explained Tadira was because God's presence is in the West. So Rabbi Akiva thinks like, Rabbi Shoban Levi, that God's presence is in the West. Whereas the Rabbi Yoshaya, we're going to see Rabbi Ishmael, who always argues with Rabbi Akiva, and we're going to see um, Rabbi Sheshet, all think God's presence is everywhere. How do we know this? Ditana, it says in a Ditana to be Rabbi Ishmael, in a bright from the house of Rabbi Ishmael, it says, How do we know that God's presence is everywhere? Shanamal. Now we're going to quote a Nevoah from Zechariah. Zechariah sees an angel who tells him, Go measure because we're going to start building the walls of Jerusalem. And as soon as that angel leaves, another angel comes and says, Jerusalem will not be surrounded by walls. It will be open. So he has these contradictory testimonies that come to him to different angels. And let's see how the angels appear to him. Shenema. So the brightest starts off, how do we know the Shechina is everywhere? Shenema. Hinei HaMalach HaDover. The Malach who is speaking to me, Yotze, goes out. He's describing the vision he saw. And there's another angel going to going to greet that angel. Now, if one angel comes from the left and is talking to Zechariah, and another angel comes to greet him, that means he's coming. It doesn't mean this. Maybe it's a bad translation. Likrato means coming opposite him, meaning coming from a different direction. Now, if God is dispatching messengers, wouldn't you think God would dispatch them from where God is? If God's in the same place, then the messengers should be all going in the same direction. So they say. Um, it doesn't say and another angel came after that first angel but it says right? uh, but it said coming toward him from there you know God's presence is everywhere God can send an angel from one place God can send an angel from another place 
And like I said, Afra Sheshat said Rav Shechina B'chol Akol. Also, Rav Sheshat said the divine presence everywhere. First of all, Rav Sheshat was blind, which is interesting because you can imagine he must feel God's presence. Now, none of us see God's presence anyway, but maybe he had a better sense of it. But really, I'm just saying that. But the reason I pointed out he's blind is because he said to his Shamash, the person who was serving him, because he needed the Shamash to do this, because he couldn't tell directions, he couldn't see. So Amar Le Rav Shesha Shame, he said to his Shamash, the person who was helping him, Lechol Ruchacha Ukman Chutz Me Mizrach, set me up to pray facing any direction, just not east. Which might sound strange to you, because many people, right, if you're in certain parts of the world, which are many parts of the world where people are living, they face east, because that's east toward Israel. Set me up in any direction other than Mizrach, other than the east. The Lavi should delay Beshechina, and not, by the way, because God's presence isn't there, because Rosh Hashanah agrees that the divine presence is everywhere. There's a different reason why he didn't want to be facing east, and what's that? And the Mishum de Moru Mine, because the heretics prayed to the east, and those are the people who thought that the God was the sun, the sun, the sun was God, and therefore if the sun rises in the east, so people would pray to the sun, and where the sun rose from to the east. So he didn't want people praying that way, because it would look like they were a mean, a heretic. The Rabbi Yavau, Amar Shechina B'Marav. Now Rabbi Yavau goes back and says what Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi and Rabbi Akiva said, which is the Shechina is in the west. To Amar Rabbi Yavau, my Oria, okay, Oria is short for Avir Ya. Okay, it's the the um, air of God, which means basically that's where God is. Now, how does Avira connect with west? So Rashi says in Persian, the word Avira meant west, and they were darshaning the Persian language with a, a Hebrew drasha, basically, which is a strange thing to do. There's different explanations offered. Some people think this isn't talking about the West. Anyway, um, I'll leave that. What we have so far, and we're not finished with this topic, but we are going to veer from it momentarily. We have this idea we started with that the, the, north, um, the West is where God's presence is, and that's why you camp at the tannery in the West, and that explains Rabbi Akiva. But there were other opinions about where God's presence is, most of them saying that God's presence is in the West. The anywhere, and it's not in any one particular place. How this relates to davening, we're going to have to get back to when we end the sugya on the next on the next side of the page. We'll come full circle and come back to well, aren't we supposed to daven toward Jerusalem? And if God's presence is everywhere, why do we need to? And you see, Rav Shesha even davened in any direction. So the whole thing we learned at Brachot about where to face seems to somewhat go against this Gemara. We will get back to that. Tosfot raises this problem on our daf um, in the Dibur Matzvah the Choruch Ha'Ukman. And basically says, maybe I'll even start here, Kohani Amorae late lehu had to tanya bebrachot. These Amorae include in hold by what it said in brachot, Shechayav Adam Nikpalel Neged Yerushalayim, that you have to face Jerusalem. Okay, and the quote there in brachot, he quotes as the pasuk in Sefer Melachim when Shlomo does the dedication in the temple, and he says, Everyone will pray through this land. So they say that it could, all these people held like Rabbi Ishmael, that God's presence is everywhere. And if you say it's in the Ma'arav, right, that's like Rabbi Akiva, and that there seem to be these different positions. And we'll only get later, he quotes Rabbi Hanino, which I'm going to wait off on until we get to the end of the studio, where he appears saying that we face Jerusalem. Okay, so again, until now, we've seen three opinions. Nor, um, sorry, first opinion, God's presence is in the West. Second opinion, which maybe is an opinion, maybe is just a counter to the, to the proof of the first Maybe God's presence in the East, or maybe not. And the, la, the third one, which is definitely an opinion, that God's presence is everywhere. Amar Rav Yehuda. Rav Yehuda now says, We're now going to take this pasuk from Ha'azinu, the brachot, right, the, the poem at the end of, um, not the brachot, sorry, the poem at the end of the shira, the song that Moshe sings at the end of Sefer Dvarim. Ya'arof kamatar l'kri, there's... Four parts to this pasuk, they're all talking about how God's word will come down to the people like rain. It will be like rain. Tizal katal and it will come down like dew, the word of God. Kisirim ale deshe. Okay, this is a little confusing what this means. Sirim are actually evil spirits that, that, that come up through the uh, in the grass. And kirivivim ale esev. And like, like, a, like they help the, the grass to grow. Okay, so this is a, a very... Mostly beautiful analogy, although the Sirim is a little bit negative, about the words of God. So now they're going to darshan, since there's four sections, they're going to connect this to the four winds. And again, we're going to learn about winds. This is the west wind that comes from the back of the world. Okay, perhaps this, they thought the west wind was a little bit dangerous, and maybe that's what it means. Rashi says, um, from the strength of the world. 
Okay, what to make of this good question? Tizal katan and bratiza roth sfonicha mazenet et tazahav. You have to also somewhat reconcile some of these different sources that seem a little contradictory. We said the north wind was good. It, it kind of tempered all the other winds. But here it seems to be saying the north wind dries everything out. And therefore, it causes the price of gold to go down. Because if there's no rain, the crop price of crops go up, which that causes price of the gold to go down, to devalue. Bechein uh, mer hazalim zahav mikis. So the... Um, the, this is another pasuk that sh- says hazalim zahav mikis that it basically is going to cause the gold to go down to be cheapened. Kesirim alei deshe zom ruach mizrachit shemaseret et kol olam kisail. Okay, the way the seirim were these evil spirits, these demons. So the ruach mizrachit causes a big stir or halabalu in the world. Okay, it's interesting. We talked before it was the south wind. This one says it's the eastern wind. Um, here it sounds like the south wind actually causes everything to grow, and it's a good wind. Okay, there clearly were different approaches about what these winds did. Now we're going to go into a bright that's going to talk about the fact that when the the way they viewed the world again, having the earth at the center of the world in their approach, their understanding, and the sun rises in the east, sets in the west, but when it traverses the earth and their viewpoint, it traverses the earth on the south side. It never really comes to the north side. The question is, what they're grappling with is, first of all, sometimes, okay, then there's winter and summer. And in the winter, it's more on the, on the, it's, um, in the winter, first of all, it's much shorter, the days, and the sun is only visible for part of the time, okay? And also it's in a different location in the summer and the winter, right? Sometimes closer to the north side, sometimes farther from the north side, and even though it never comes to the north side. So there's a few issues they're grappling with in terms of what they saw in the world, and this sort of tries to explain it, okay? I say tries to because it's hard to, first of all, their whole approach was definitely not what we believe to be the way it is today, or the way we understand it today. And also, right, they, they knew less than we did about it. And also, some people think that this whole sugi is allegorical, and it's really meant to talk about imperfection in the world, and, and not really to talk about what actually is going on in the constellations. So, or between the sun and the earth. So with that, we'll get started and it will be a little bit confusing, but I'll try to explain it as best as I can. Time. Rabbi Eliezer of Omeo. Rabbi Eliezer says, we're gonna see a machlok of Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua. Olam la'achsadra hudome. The world is like a portico, which has three walls on three sides and one side is open. We're now going to learn that the Ruach Tzvonit Enam Subevet, the, the side, now Ruach doesn't mean wind here, it means direction. The direction of the north is not closed. Okay, so we basically have the portico is on three sides closed, on the east, west, and south, and on the north it's open. The Kevan Shigia Chama, it's a Karamaravit, Tzvonit, so now the sun goes, now we're going to explain why you never see the sun on the south side. Because when the sun goes from east to west on the southern part, okay, like around the south side, then it gets to the northern tip, right? Of, it gets to the west on the northwest, and then it leaves. Okay, now this, it, it's all open there. So it can't go there. So what does it do? Because it's open. So it goes out, okay? It like leaves the atmosphere, you could say, sort of, but not exactly. Now, Okay, let's just read again. As soon as it gets to the west, northwest corner at the end of the day, basically, as the sun sets. Now, why don't you see the sun anymore? Well, the sun, this is also explaining why you don't see the sun at night. The sun goes out of earth, away from earth, when it gets to that open area, and it goes basically up above the firmament. Rabbi Yeshua Omer, Olam Kuba Hudome. What do you mean? It's closed on all four sides. The Ruch Tzfonit Mesubefet, and the the side of the the northern side is closed also. So now we have to explain if the sun's going in the walls, right? That's what we're assuming. It went in the walls, and when it got to that open area, it kind of had to go somewhere, so it goes up. But now we're going to say it goes in the walls. Well, then if it goes in the walls, then you should see it in the north also during the night. So what do they explain? When it gets that northwestern side, at the end of the day, when it sets, it leaves that closed-in area, 
goes outside, traverses the northern side, and then comes back in in the morning on the east side. So it traverses that whole north side, okay, from like even northwest, right, going all the way around to the east again. Now, how do we know this? And they're going to explain some pasuk in Kohelet, in the beginning of Kohelet in the first chapter. Shenema, holech el darom v'sovev el tzafon. It goes to the south, and then it goes around, like it, it traverses it. It goes outside to the north. Holech el v'chule, holech el darom bayom v'sovev el tzafon balayla. So the holech el darom part, it goes to the south, it goes by the south, is during the day, and that's when you see the sun. And it goes by the north at night, and it goes again, sovev, it goes around and outside. Sovev, sovev, holech ha-ruach. The puzzle continues. It goes around and around, double language. Ve'al svivotav shav ha-ruach. And on its, its rotations, it come, the wind comes back. So how do they explain this? What do they explain this to mean? Elu p'nei mizrach u'p'nei ma'arav. Shepa'amim misavavtan u'p'amim mahalachtan. This is the face of the west and the eastern side. This is like where they are. In other words, again, there's east to west, but there's northeast, northwest, right? So we have the, I'm sorry, south, northwest, southwest, right? The west has part that goes, traverses from the south to the north. So that's the Pnei Mizrach and the Pnei Ma'arav. Shepamim Misabavtan. Sometimes in the winter months, it goes around that part outside. L'sovev again means outside. And you don't see it, okay? That's in the, in the winter months because in the winter months, it doesn't even get to anywhere on the northern part because it, it goes the short way. It goes from the south side, from north, from uh, east to west, and then immediately leaves. And then the longer, right, this is because the day is short. And then it has, right, if you imagine, like it's a circle, it's going around, it's doing an orbit. As it goes around the, the, the west, the, pne, uh, the panim of the west, and then the Panim of the East, right, early in the morning and late at night, it's going around the west side of the north, or, or just even not late at night. That's the whole point. In the, sum, in the winter months, it's a long time. It's from, you know, 4 o'clock, depending on where you live, four, 5 o'clock, it's already out the sun. It goes around and gets all the way back to the southern side and only then comes back in with a late sunrise. That's, in the, that's when it's Sivavtan, Pa'amim Mahalachtan. Sometimes the Panim Israch and the Panim Arav, right, the part that's on the southern side, going closer to the northern side of the west and the east, the sun actually travels inside, and you see it, and that's at the long summer days. Huayaomeo. Okay, so now the bright to continue. So we have these two approaches. Is the world, is the earth, closed on four sides, and the sun just kind of leaves, and that's why we don't see it, and sometimes it does that short traverse, sometimes it does a longer traverse and gets more to the north um, during the daytime, you know, and the Right, so wherever there's a longer traverse in the day, there'll be a shorter traverse at night, um, or reverse. Or is it the first opinion, which is it's all open and just it leaves, right, and goes up into the heavens, okay, and then comes back down at night and that in the morning. That's why you don't see it on that northern side. That northern side is fully open. That's why it has to go up to the heaven, up to the, above the firmament, and only comes down in the morning. And that's why we don't see the moon at the uh, sun at night. Now they say, Huayalmir, the Brighta continues. And the, the Gemara stops us to tell you, oh, by the way, Anton the Rebbe Leezer, we're back to Rebbe Leezer, who thought that the north side was fully open. And he's going to show where he knows this from a pasuk, that it's open. Min hacheder tavo sufa, it's a pasuk in Eov. The sufa will come, the, the storm will come from the cheder, from the room. Zo ruach dromit. Okay, they explain this is the south side, because the south side is the room. What does it mean it's the room? Well, it's got walls on all three sides because it's got the south side and it borders on the west and the east. So it's the innermost point is the south, whereas the north is all open and the west and the east are open on the north side and closed on the south side. So there are only like two walls. So the cheder is where the, the, the bad is going to come from, and that's the south. So that proves to you that the north is open. Umi mazarin kara. Okay, now. This is a little unclear what this means. Zorach Tzvonit, again, by the way, this thing that Rabbi Lanzer is saying is talking about the, the different strengths, right? This says the, the south is where the dangerous wind is going to come, which match one of the sources we saw, but not the other. Mimazarim Kara Rashi explains what this means. Shadofen Muzeret Upursa. That the doorway, the, 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 the wall is open and, and exposed. Okay, and here's again a proof that from the cheder, the inner part is the south, the outer part is the north, right? Then that's open. And 
Sorry, we must link kara zor svamit. Okay, now what does it mean kara? Some people say it means the cold is going to come, but that's really difficult because the next line says cold. Okay, we're going to talk about kerach and for ice. But some people say it just means that it's it's open, and from there, I'll try to remember. Um, I forgot the way they explain kara. They explain it some other way, but but really meaning the the key word is mazarim. It's it's pazur. It's open. Minishmat el yitin kerach. So the next part of that pasuk is the ice will come, and that comes from the west. The roch of mayim b'mutzak, and the water will come. So roch mizrachi. That's where the east, the water comes from the east. So now they just ask a side question about this. Baha Amar Mar, didn't we say before roch dromit malei revivim mukadelas asavim? We now go back to that last source at the bottom of Amar Aleph, which said that the roch dromit is good. Here it says the roch dromit is bad. There's two different ways that rain can come from the south. It can either come in torrents or it could come gently. When it comes gentle, that's good, and it, it brings all the crops to grow. But when it comes in torrents, it's, it's hazardous, dangerous, causes all sorts of problems. Right? With all the global warming and weather issues, right? we understand this very well. I mean, I'm sure it went on then, too. Amar Rav Chista, my dichtiv mitzafon zahav Okay, from the north, the Zahav, Yete, we're going to explain what this means. Zeruach Tzfoni, Shemazelet et Zahav. Again, why the Tzfon and the Zahav, what's the connection? It means that the Zahav will be decreased because of the north, because again, once the crops start going up in price, the gold is going to drop in price, uh, in value. And then it quotes again this Pasuk we saw before that Zalim, will, in terms of cheapens the gold from our pockets. Amar from Bar Papa Amar of Chista, another statement quoted in the name of Rav Chista. Yom Shachara Beit Hamidra Beit Hamikdash from the day the temple was destroyed. Lo Hukshema Ruach Dromit. The Ruach Dromit doesn't bring rain anymore. Shneim Al Vayigzor Al Yamin VeRaev. This is a pasuk from Yeshayahu that God is going to make a decree on the Yamin. He said the Yamin is the south, and there will be famine, meaning there won't be any rain. When they will eat on the left, and they will not be satiated. Uchtiv. Safon the Yamin atabaratam. Now, how do we know Yamin is nor is south? Because it says Safon and Yamin. You built right atabaratam. You created both north and right. So right must be south because it's the opposite of north. The Amara from Bar Papa Amara of Chista. Another statement that Rafram brings in the name of Rav Papa uh, Rav Chista. It's our third statement in, of Rav Chista, but two by the name of Raf. We passed on by Rafram. From the time the temple was destroyed, no more rain comes from the good treasures of God. And we don't have any more good rain. All the rain is bad rain. So God will open up his good treasure. When the Jews do what God wants and the Jews are living in the land of Israel, then the rain comes from the good place. But they learn from this pasuk that when the Jews don't do the way of God and they're not living in the land, then the rain doesn't come from the Otsar Tov. And since the temple was destroyed and the people left Israel, they weren't getting good rains anymore. What exactly they mean by this is a good question. In Babylonia, there were good rains. Maybe what they meant the land of Israel wasn't getting good rains um, because the land of Israel always struggles with rain. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Harotzeh Sheyachkim Yedri. Now we're going to go back to, okay, we got kind of sidetracked with all these things about the winds and the different directions, and from there we got to how the sun goes around the earth and their belief. Um, now we're going to go back to the issue of directions. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Harotzeh Sheyachkim, and particularly davening in that direction, although some people do understand this is going to mean something a little different. Harotzeh Sheyachkim, if you want to be wise, Yedri, face the south when you pray. Some people think this means go to the Chachamim in the south. In other words, it doesn't mean daven to God t- t- facing south. It means go find people in the south. They know how to teach you chokhmah, intel- you know, wisdom. The Shia, Shiel, if you want to get wealthy, yet spin, go to the north. Okay, so again, either it means pray toward the north if you want to get wealthy, pray toward the south if you want to get wise. It's a little bit of a strange thing. See in a minute that someone totally disagrees with this. Vesimanech, and the way to remember this is Shulchan B'Tzafon, in the temple. The Shulchan was in the north, and the Shulchan represents the bread, which is the food, which is sustenance, which is money. The menorah, which is the light, which is representative of Torah, was in the south. Rabbi Yishob and Levi Amal, Le'olam Yadrim. He disagrees and says you should always pray toward the south. 
mitoch, shemitoch shemitrakem mitasher, again, whether it means to pray or it means to go to the Chachamim there, because if you get wise, then you'll also be wealthy. These are not two different talents to learn. These all go hand in hand. We say this at the sea of every time, which is long life, longevity is in the right, meaning if you get what's in the right, which is in the south, which is the wisdom, you will have in your left, meaning that will come hand in hand. One leads to the other. In other words, the wisdom leads to the wealth. But if we understand, especially if we understand the Sugi that we say, turn to the south to pray to God, which by the way, we now have a fourth opinion. I forgot to mention this, right? We had West, East, maybe it was an opinion, we're not sure, everywhere, and now pray to the South or maybe the North, depending on what you're looking for. So we now have all the possibilities. And how could Rabbi Yeshua say, well, do Darong when he said before, you should do Ma'arav. So, which is West. So, to which they answered, the Mitzah de Ratzdude. You face the west, but turn your head to the south. Here comes our opinion number five. Rabbi Hanina says to You who are living, and you'll see why maybe this is five, maybe it's part of four. It says, You who are living in the north of Eretz Israel, which is Babylonia, it was actually northeast, but north. Adrimu Adrimuye. You should face south. In other words, maybe this whole south thing isn't a new opinion. Maybe it's opinion four. And maybe opinion five is we'll face Jerusalem. Okay? But what he's saying is you who are living up north should be facing south. Okay? When you said south, you were talking to the people in Babylonia. Okay? But right to Babel, this Fonad Eretz Israel Kaim and Dirtiv. How do we know that that Babylonia is north of Israel? No, not because we looked at a map, but because Dirtiv makes a fati patacharal, call Yoshvaya Aretz. Very famous pasuk in your meow, first chapter, right? The, the the bad is going to come from the north. So what do you see here? Babylonia is in the north. Now, we so again, this could be just a playoff on the Darom, that the Darom wasn't because Darom specifically, go south, or, you know, pray south wherever you are. It just could be that they were in Babylonia and they were talking about south because that was for them, it was south. So that would then say either South is one and this is another, or maybe that's all one and the same, which is pray toward Israel. And that's again matching the Sugnit and Brachot that we saw. Okay, getting back now to our mission, we finally finished this long section. So now we have to say we're separating the, the flax that you're soaking from veg vegetables because all that liquid, the water there, all the moisture is going to ruin the crop. Tana Rabbi Yossi Matir Bachardal. And then there's a bright that says Rabbi Yossi, right? The, the mission actually said the Rabbi Yossi is Matir Bachardal, but the bright says, the bright has a more extended version, which we saw when we were in Dafi Yuchet. She a cholomar lo, ajatal really, our chay kar dechamin tvorai, her chay tvorai nin chadrla, dvorecha mi chadrla. The reason why he matirs that he permits it in chardal is because you could say, right, um, you're telling me move my mustard, but because it's bothering your bees, but your bees are bothering my mustard as well. So, that's why you don't have to move the chardal. Shabbat v'achlot l'glugei chardalai, because they eat my mustard seeds. New mission. You might remember we had a whole discussion about that. What's his real disagreement with the rabbis? We had different interpretations. Machikim ta'ilam in abor esrim b'chamei shama. So the new mission says you have to move a tree from a pit, 25 um, cubits. U'becharuvu b'shikma in a in a carob or a sycamore tree, chamishim ama, because they have much longer their, their, um, their roots extend much farther. Whether the tree is up and the boar is, like the tree is up in a mountain and the boar is down in the ground, in the valley, or the boar is up and the tree is down. We'll talk about this soon in the Gemara. Or or if they're next to each other. Either which way, 50 cubits for those and 25 for a regular tree. And this we all saw already quoted in Daphne Chet. If the boar is first, so if the boar came first, we actually saw the continuation of this, but the boar was there first, and then you you planted your tree. You have to move your tree, but no tindami. So you can insist that they cut down the tree, but you have to give him the money back for it, the owner of the tree. But it's a little strange. Why do you have to do that if they shouldn't have done it? But they say you have to compensate them because in the end they're cutting it down for you. But if the tree was there first, like a kutz, you can't make the person of the tree, right, the owner of the tree, cut down their tree because they put it before you put your boar. Why did you put your boar there if my tree was already there? 
Safek Zekadam, Safek Zekadam, what if we're not sure who put it first? Lo Yakutz, we can't insist, you know, one can't insist that the other one cut down their tree. Rabbi Yossi, even if the boar was there first and then I planted my tree, right, we saw this also quoted. Lo Yakutz, Shazek Chofer B'Toch Shalom, Vezeno Teha B'Toch Shalom. He's got the approach. Everyone can do what they want on their own property. And you don't have to worry about the other person. And that's what we explained in the end, when we struggled to explain Rabbi Yossi exactly, that Rabbi Yossi thinks everyone can do what they want. And it's on the Nizak, the one who's getting damaged, to move their issue, their their item that's getting damaged. The Gemara starts off, Tana, they're bringing up right. Ben Shabor Lamata Vilan Lamala, Ben Shabor Lamata Vilan Lamata. So now we want to understand this line. Bishlama, sorry, this isn't a bright, this was our Mishnah. I get if the boar is down and the tree is up because the roots grow down into the ground. It will get into the boar. So the roots go and damage the boar. If the boar is up and the ilan is lamata and the ilan is below ground, why would it be a problem? If the roots go down, 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 what are they going to affect the pit? They cause the ground to rot and eventually will rot the, the underneath where the boar is the bottom of the boar. Okay, even though the boar is up, but the bottom of the boar and underneath the boar can get ruined and that will eventually ruin the boar. Rabbi Yossi Omer, we're now just quoting that line from the Gemara, the Mishnah, even though the boar came, was there first before the tree, so I plant my tree later, it's not my fault, I don't have to remove it. Rabbi Yehuda says in the name Rabbi Yehuda says in the name Shmuel, we pass on the Rabbi Yossi, but Rabbi Ashi says, when I was with Rabbi Kahana, he told me that Rabbi Yossi admits though. He says, in the case where I am directly causing you damage, if I pour water and my water streams right from my field into yours in a way that ruins it, that's direct damages, I'm responsible. So even though he says I can do whatever I want in my property, as long as I'm not directly damaging you. So Gary delay, Gary means arrows. It's like if I'm shooting a direct arrow at you, that I can't do. Papa Yonai Niva Shilhava. There was a guy, his name was Papa Yonai. He was poor and then he became wealthy. Bana Pandi, he built a beautiful castle, palace. Havu Hanach Atzore Beshebevute. There were people in his in his village that were crushing sesame seeds. And his palace would shake every time they, they, they crushed their, right? They used the millstone and the vibrations caused the walls of his of his uh, palace to shake. Atta the commander of Ashi. So they went before Rav Ashi Amarle. He said to him, Rabbi Yossi said, right, he quotes this thing that Rav Kahana said, that if it's direct damage, and this is direct damage, because every time they, they use their millstone, it shakes your walls. And the comma, how much is considered damage? So they say, which Rashi, which Rashi explains, if there's a different, few different ways of understanding this, if you put a jug on the wall with a cover on it and the cover starts shaking, then that right from the vibration, that is considered that it's damaging your wall because if it shakes that much, right, they would shake the cover of your, of your jug, then that's a sign that it's ruining your walls. And then it would be direct damage and even everybody else he would agree. Okay, so quick review of today's stuff. We started with things you have to distance from the city. Do you have to, what things can you put on one side right? smell, things with foul odors? Then we said, okay, well, Rabbi Akiva had this opinion not on the west, but every other direction you could. And then we had to try to figure out what was unique about the west, to which we said, oh, it's because the west is where God's presence is. There we got to all the different opinions about God's presence. From there, we got off on a tangent about the, the different directions of the winds. We had a whole bunch of things about the winds and the directions. And then we got into the, how the, the, they believed that the sun went around the earth and why sometimes it's shorter days, sometimes longer days. Why do we see it? During the day, we don't see the sun at night. Where, the, where does the sun go? Different approaches. Is is the world three walls with one open side or all, all the sides closed in, right? Whatever this means is very hard to understand. And there are some people who understand it allegorically. And then from there, we got to, um, so, and then we had all these different opinions about which direction you pray in. And then we finished with the other things that you have to distance from another and some of the details regarding those cases in the mission. With that, we finish for today, wishing everybody a Shabbat Shalom.